You're listening to PetLifeRadio.com. Hello, and welcome to Working Like Dogs on Pet Life Radio. Thank you for joining us today. We're your hosts. My name is Marcy Davis, and of course, my trusty co-host, my service dog, Whistle. And Whistle and I are thrilled to be with you to talk about our favorite subject, working dogs and working animals. And today, our guest is Megan Talbert. And Megan is the Executive Director of Helping Hands, Monkey Helpers for the Disabled. And Helping Hands is a national nonprofit organization that serves quadriplegic and other people with severe spinal cord injuries or mobility limitations by providing highly trained monkeys to assist with their daily activities. And I have always been so interested in monkeys as helpers, so I'm so thrilled that Megan is with us today to talk about her program and to educate us about these amazing service animals. So come right back after these quick messages as we get to welcome Megan. We'll be right back, right after these messages. Stay tuned. anything we won't do to make sure they're getting the best products and the best care. So when you ask us a question like, So how do you feel about cat condos? We can say from experience, Feels like home. For her. Enter the code WORK10, W-O-R-K, the number 10, and get 10% off any order. No minimum at Petco.com. There's a movement afoot, ShoeBuy.com. Join the millions of people who shop ShoeBuy.com's over 400 brands and 500,000 products. Order now and get free shipping and free return shipping. ShoeBuy.com, the world's greatest shoe store. Walk your dog in style and comfort. Enter the code WORKING, W-O-R-K-I-N-G, at checkout and get a 10% discount plus free shipping at ShoeBuy.com. How would you like your business to reach out and invite in our audience? We have a brand new trademark concept called Info Seeds. Info Seeds are short 20 second seeds of information about your place of business, practice, or service. We only have a limited number of slots left. For more information, visit PetLifeRadio.com. Click on sponsorship information. There you can listen to a sample of Info Seed or email us at PetLifeRadio.com. Remember, only a limited number of opportunities are available. Pets can be a wonderful addition to your life because they're a member of the family. Keeping them healthy and happy is important. Pet Life Radio presents The Pet Doctor with veterinary media consultant and veterinarian Dr. Bernadine Cruz. Whether you have a dog, cat, reptile, or rabbit, you'll find answers for your pets straight from the vets. The Pet Doctor, on demand every week, only on PetLifeRadio.com. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to Working Like Dogs on Pet Life Radio. And today our guest is Megan Talbert from Helping Hands. Hello, Megan, and welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. Well, I'm so excited you could be here. I, I just love your program, and I wanted you to tell our listeners, what is Helping Hands? How did it originate? Sure. Helping Hands began kind of as an experiment in 1979. Some occupational therapists and social workers were working with spinal cord injury patients in the hospital setting after their injuries, and they were finding that they had the help to get them out of bed every day and into their wheelchairs and, you know, have, you know, feeding and clothing and those types of things, but it was those little everyday tasks that were frustrated to people, you know, dropping a mouse stick or dropping, you know, a remote control or scratching an itch on their face. And they thought, well, we, we can train dogs to help people who are, who are blind. Perhaps we can train a primate to help somebody who is paralyzed. And the rest is history. 
Wow, it is history. <laughs> when was that, Megan? How long ago was that? That was in 1979. Our first placement was with a gentleman named Robert Foster, and his monkey was named Hellion. Wow. And how many commands did you guys start out with for the monkeys? Well, they know a series of command words, but they also know how to follow a laser pointer, which is set up either for mouth control or very simple hand control. So, for example, if you were wanting to listen to a particular CD in your CD player, you could just shine the laser on the CD that you wanted to listen to, and the monkey knows to fetch that one in particular, and then would follow a series of commands to, to put it into the player. Oh, that's so cool. I wondered how what you used in order to, to get their attention and to get them to realize what their person needed. So that's really cool. And how long does it take to train the monkeys? Well, we wait until the monkeys are mature enough for training. So they're in foster care when they're, when they're young and when they're babies. And then when they come into the training center here in Boston, it typically takes anywhere from three to five years to train a monkey. Some are very motivated and learn very quickly. Others take a little bit more time. How long do they stay with the family? Is that all part of that? Yeah, again, that depends. Typically, at least eight to 10 years. Monkeys will live 30 to 40 years in captivity, so we give them plenty of time to be adolescents before we bring them in for training. Ah, that's so cool. Wow. Well, and so how many monkeys do you have in foster families and in training at, at one time? We have about 180 monkeys in the whole program, so that's in between foster families. Um, we typically have between 40 to 45 monkeys in training at any given time, and then the rest of the monkeys are actively working in homes in placements. Gosh, and where do you get the monkeys from? Do you breed them, or do you work with someone to get them, another agency? Um, the monkeys have all been bred for this purpose, most recently at Southwick Zoo in Menden, Massachusetts here. That's awesome. Wow. And so how can someone become a foster trainer with the monkeys? Does it have to be a family or can it be an individual? Um, it could be a family or an individual. Foster parents need to not work outside the home, so nobody that works full time, um, just because the monkeys need a lot of attention and stimulation throughout the day. And it also, our foster families need to, need to be in a state that allows, allows for um, foster monkeys to be in a home. Okay. And so did they do all the training in the home? Do they do any outside of the home work with them? Any socializing type things? Our monkeys are, are all trained to be home helpers only. So they're not out in public. Our monkeys don't go to grocery stores or restaurants with any of our recipients or anything like that. It's really not appropriate for the monkey. And as you can imagine, you know, the kind of commotion and excitement it brings um, doesn't allow for a lot of privacy for our recipients. I can certainly relate to that. Yes, just with having a dog, there, as I tell people, there's no more running to the grocery store to get milk and run out, not yeah. when you have an animal with you. So I can only imagine what that would be like with one of these darling little monkeys, what that would do to the public of wanting to touch and, and be a part of that experience. Yeah. yeah, and monkeys have a very strict hierarchy. So they're not, you know, strangers are not somebody they're particularly interested in. They like the people that are in their home environment, the same people, the same stability every day. Yeah, which I'm sure makes them part of why they're such great workers for someone with a disability. It's a mutually beneficial relationship because they see their recipient as alpha. I take care of you, you take care of me. Yeah, yeah, which makes sense. Yeah, so who makes a good candidate for a monkey helper? Again, somebody that's not working outside their home and is spending the majority of time in their homes each day. Somebody who has a pretty good um, support system, either with family or the same kind of health care attendance every day, you know, that are willing to help out with those everyday needs of the monkey, helping feed and bathe and, 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 and clean up after the monkey as far as their cage and whatnot. We look for people that are looking, you know, obviously for the tasks and the independence, but are also really interested in developing that relationship and that bond and, and looking for that, that companionship because that's a lot of what our animals provide to the people that they are placed with. Yeah, I, and, and it's so great that they live so much longer than a canine does, which really helps to extend that relationship and that bond. But I can only imagine how difficult it is when they either have to be retired or are they, and do they retire? Maybe that's my question. Well, actually, really, we don't ever have people say, you know, are my monkeys really slowing down? They're not doing as many tasks. I want to trade it in for a new one because it's like a child. So, you know, our recipients, as the monkeys age, you know, they really do, they might change what they do every day, but they really want that animal in their life. So we've never actually had a recipient say, you know, I, I want a younger monkey. You know, these monkeys really become like children for the people that they're placed with. 
Yeah. And so have you so have you lost some monkeys to death, I mean, to old age? Yep, absolutely. We've lost some monkeys to death in old age. Um, we've lost some recipients to death in old age. And, yeah. you know, the thing about our program is, you know, if a recipient passes away, that monkey will come back to Boston and can be placed again with another recipient. Okay, I was wondering about that, about how that would work. And how do the monkeys do with that if they come back? You know, the interesting thing about monkeys is they don't really grieve like we would. Because of their hierarchy, they need to bond with the next person that's going to take care of them. So it's unfortunately, well, or actually fortunately for the monkeys, it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. They might be confused and, you know, know that there's been a change. But when they come back to Boston, they see the trainers they know and the people they know, and they see the other monkeys and they go, okay, I'm going to be safe here, and now I'm going to bond with the next person, i.e. their trainer that's going to that's take care of me. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very, it's not so much feelings based as survival based. Um, You got it. Exactly. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I know. We always try to think about that our our animals have feelings, but realistically it can be very different and they, they respond differently. Well, that's great though, that they can actually go on to another person that might need them because I can only imagine that you have a long waiting list for monkeys. Well, the interesting thing about, about Helping Hands is our waiting list is not, you know, next person, next monkey. So we always encourage people to apply because we really base our monkeys on a personality match. Our placements are done knowing that, you know, this person's personality and home environment is going to be just the perfect setting for this monkey and their strengths and weaknesses. So um, we're always looking for new applicants, and we certainly don't want people to be discouraged thinking, oh, I'm never going to get a monkey. You might have just what it takes for a monkey that we have in training right now. Yeah, oh, that's really encouraging to hear. And I, I believe I read where the recipients do not pay for the monkeys. Is that true? Absolutely. Absolutely. All of our services are done at no cost to our recipients. We realize that the people that we're serving, you know, any funds that they get as far as, you know, health care and, and government really need to go for their own personal care. Um, it costs Helping Hands about $40,000 per animal to, to raise, train, and place that animal. And all of that is covered by individual donations and foundation grants. That's wonderful. Yeah, because I always tell people, if you have a disability, don't even think about it unless you win the lottery. Because mm-hmm. it's so expensive to it, live with a is. disability. Yeah, for all the equipment and assistive devices that it takes, plus all the medical care, it can be really yeah. overwhelming. So that's really great that your organization can do that. What about ongoing health care for the animals? Do you um, do that as well? Yep, exactly. You know, some of our recipients are able to pay for, you know, a bag of chow, you know, monkey chow or once yearly vet appointment. But again, if they're not able to afford that, Helping Hands will pay for that. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's awesome that you guys do that. That's really a commitment. We have wonderful wonderful donors and supporters who really believe in what we do and and understand what it's like you know, to have a disability and not have the funds, funds available to, to have, to pay for an animal. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's wonderful. So, um, for the vet care, do they take the animal to the vet or do they try to get a vet to do a home visit? Typically before we do a placement, we will call in the area and find somebody that is willing to do that once a year vet check. And we have vet techs on staff who walk new veterinarians who've never seen a monkey through the process. And it's actually, it's actually quite simple. If a monkey has a more serious veterinary need, I mean, needs surgery, for example, we will actually go out and bring that monkey back to Boston to be cared for by our vet team here. Yeah. And your vet team there, is that part of your organization or are they with another facility? Um, We we have two um, veterinary technicians that work on staff and then we have a veterinary advisory board here in Massachusetts that is comprised of um, primate experts that help us manage all the health of our of our colony nationwide. So how does someone go about applying for a monkey? The best way is to um, go to our website and there is some information on you know who who exactly uh, makes a good candidate and there's an initial form that we ask people to fill out and that will get the, kind of the ball rolling. There's a, a longer 10-page application that asks a lot about people's injury and their abilities and the people in their home and the tasks that they're hope, hoping to have help with. We also do written references as well as phone references and then finally we ask people to make a video of their home environment and the people in their home so we can get a better idea of the layout of their home and the people in their home. And how long does the application process usually take? 
you know, it, it really depends on, on the person and how motivated they are to complete each step. It could take anywhere from three months to a year, depending on, on how long it takes them to complete the individual, individual pieces. Do you do a site visit, a home visit with them, or do you rely on that video? We always try to do a site visit when we can. Um, it's certainly expensive to fly across the country just to do yeah. a site visit. But if we're in the area on another placement and we have somebody you know, within a couple hours drive, that's an applicant, we'll certainly go by. And certainly anybody that's within a couple hours drive from Boston, um, we will certainly visit in person as well. Right. Wow. Well, this is very exciting. Well, we are going to take a quick break to hear some messages from our sponsors. And we're going to come right back and continue talking with Megan about her program. And my next thing I want to ask Megan is about the Monkey College. So come right back after these quick messages and we'll hear Megan share some more great information with us. We'll be right back right after these messages. Stay tuned. Love your pets but wish their medications were a lot less expensive? They are at 1-800-PET-MEDS. You'll not only save on flea and heartworm medications, but on prescriptions for arthritis, incontinence, thyroid, and more. And you get fast service, free shipping, and a 100% satisfaction guarantee. Plus, our licensed pharmacists ensure accuracy, monitor drug interaction, and more. See why over 5 million people have trusted their pet's health to 1-800-PET-MEDS, America's largest pet pharmacy. Call now or order online. Go to PetMeds.com forward slash work, W-O-R-K, to get 10% off any order and free shipping on orders of $39 or more at PetMeds.com. Celebrate your special occasion and give her this classic semi-eternity band created with one carat brilliant diamonds channel set in 14 carat white gold. Exclusively yours from ice.com. Free shipping over $150, free returns and 30 day money back guarantee. Go to ice.com and use promo code ACTFP and get 20% off your purchase or use promo code Code ADTFP and get 20% off at diamond.com, ice.com, or diamond.com. Get 20% off from Pet Life Radio. FTD's network of over 40,000 florists around the world have been creating beautiful handcrafted arrangements for 100 years. Each arrangement is delivered the same day and backed by FTD's seven-day satisfaction guarantee. For a century, people have trusted their most important occasions to the flower experts at FTD. Since Pet Life Radio is all about puppy dogs and flowers, our listeners, that's you, can get a 20% discount on your order. Just go to florop.com and use the code WORK1234 at checkout. F-L-E-U-R-O-P dot com, code word W-O-R-K-1234. How would you like your business to reach out and invite in our audience? We have a brand new trademark concept called Info Seeds. Info Seeds are short 20 second seeds of information about your place of business, practice, or service. Is the best, most cost effective way to invite us in. We only have a limited number of slots left. For more information, visit the website PetLifeRadio.com. Click on sponsorship information. There you can listen to a sample of Info Seed. Remember, only a limited number of opportunities are available. Hi, this is Tim Link, host of Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Join me as we feature interviews with best-selling pet-related authors, award-winning writers, and journalists, and bloggers. And we'll tell stories about the animals and interesting topics about the animals in our lives. Each of the interviews will give you a first-hand knowledge about why the authors and writers chose a particular story, what the feature animals meant to them, and what has become of those animals that we've talked about. And of course, I'll also share stories from my own books, blogs, articles, and experiences. So be sure to join me and the writers and authors on Animal Rights. Every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. <laughs> Welcome back to Working Like Dogs on Pet Life Radio. 
and we're visiting today with Megan Talbert from Helping Hands. And before our break, I was saying that we were going to come back and ask Megan about what is Monkey College. So tell us, Megan, what is that? Monkey College is a specifically designed facility that we built here in Boston that houses all of our monkeys in training. So we bring the monkeys in when they're mature enough for training, typically around 8 to 10 years old, and we begin their training. And all the training is done through imitation. So monkey see, monkey do is really what our trainers do every day. (laughs) So that may start in a cubicle in a very small room. We're really teaching the monkey to focus on the trainer's actions. So that might be simple as putting a ball in a cup or a ring on a post so that that monkey really understands, wow, I'm doing a good thing when I do exactly as my trainer does. From there, we're able to break down the more complicated tasks. For example, putting a CD into a CD player into three or four smaller tasks that the monkey will learn individually. And then once they've learned all of those steps, we'll put together the whole task. Ah, and how do you reward the monkeys for doing these tasks? All of our training is done through positive reinforcement. So the monkeys will get verbal praise as well as a small lick of peanut butter when they've done (laughs) something correct. (laughs) Yeah, my service dogs have always liked peanut butter. Yes, it's a good good tool. It's a magical training treat, absolutely. (laughs) It, It is, it is. Oh, that's so cool. Well, and so how long really is monkey college? How long does that last? Monkey College, a monkey is usually here um, between three and five years um, to get through all of the steps um, of training, which includes all of the task training as well as potty training. So um, potty training, for example, is when they feel the need to relieve themselves, um, they will run back to their cage, um, which is about the size of a standard refrigerator and has a mesh floor that's about 18 inches off of a tray. So just like kind of like a bird cage everything will fall through into a chucks or some newspaper that's on the bottom of the cage. Ah, okay. Okay, well, and tell us, Megan, how did you get involved with this organization? I actually started when I was a freshman at Boston University. Um, I was looking through a work-study catalog knowing that I needed to get a job. And, you know, I was looking at different jobs like, you know, checking IDs at the gym or helping out at the library. And one of the jobs available was training monkeys to help people with disabilities. I just said, that is the coolest thing I've ever heard. So yeah, um, I actually worked there during my, my years at Boston University and, um, you know, took a little bit of break when I graduated and worked out in, uh, in the corporate world for a little while and, and really missed the monkeys and really missed the program. So I had an opportunity to come back and, and do placements throughout the country and the rest is history. Wow. Well, so what all does your job entail then with the organization? Do you do any actual training or more placements? <laughs> well, as, as executive director, um, I certainly do have my hand in just about everything. Um, I am very heavily involved in the placement process, you know, matching monkeys with applicants. Um, I do travel several times a year to work on work on placements along with other staff members. So we, unlike other service organizations, we will travel to somebody's home and do all of their training within their home environment. They don't have to come to us for their training. Wow, um, and that's certainly great. the other things that I do are certainly with marketing and outreach and fundraising is, is also a huge, a huge important mm-hmm. factor. How many staff do you have? We have 12 people on staff. Three of them are part-time and nine full-time. Wow. Are now most of those trainers or are they? Yep. The majority of them are trainers. And then we also have some people that are fundraising staff and, and office staff as well. And how does someone become a trainer? I know people always stop me and ask me that. How can they train service animals? How do they get into that field? Yep. Well, the majority of, of our trainers, our full-time staff, have actually come through either as volunteers or work-study students while they were in college here in Boston. You know, you really do learn on the job. Personally, I was an English major. You know, we've had history history majors and, you know, all sorts of different backgrounds of people. It's just the people that really do well do well with the monkeys that, that excel. Yeah, yeah, I know. It, it's hard for people to hear that, too, because they think there should be some class they could go to, you know, that could get yep. a certification that they could do that. And do no, you it's guys... working hard. Yeah, and having that talent. Yeah, because it really is a gift. It is, and it's learning to, to work with the animals, and, you know, it's not always glamorous. Um, you work with animals and, and people, you work on holidays, you work on weekends, you know, you work late nights. It's, it's really the passion for the job that, that keeps people here. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, do you guys belong to any of the service organizations, you know, like Assistance Dogs International, or do you have any groups like that that you belong to? We actually don't. It's, it, you know, because we are the only organization, you know, in the country that's doing this as a 501c3, training monkeys specifically, there's not really a group or an association that's what that I we wondered. belong to. Yeah, yeah, we're kind of standing on our own here. Yeah, you are the group. Yeah. Yep, you got it. You got it. Well, I was wondering, too, about because I had heard that the Americans with Disabilities Act had some changes regarding their definition of service animals. And I was wondering if that had impacted your organization, if you had any thoughts about that. Yeah, you know, we knew that was coming up, and we actually worked with the Department of Justice, and, and they said to us, you know, the ADA is really not specifically aimed at you because your animals are not helping people in public. So it's really not an issue for you guys. And, you know, we said it's, it's great to be recognized by the ADA, but we do believe very strongly as an organization that these animals shouldn't be in public. It's not appropriate for the animal, and it's not appropriate for our recipients. So, you know, the ADA might affect us a little bit as far as state permitting goes, you know, and certainly access, you know, to be able to fly with our animals on airplanes. But to date, we really haven't seen, you know, too much change from that decision. You know, it's it's disappointed not to be recognized by the ADA because it's certainly, you know, the big national law that covers covers all service animals and people with disabilities. But it really doesn't affect what we, we do and what our recipients need to do on a day-to-day basis. Yeah. Well, it sounds like the big key to that is, like you said, that these animals stay inside someone's home instead of needing public access. But I was wondering about when you place the monkeys, how do you work with the airlines or, or how do you get them transported to their new home? Yeah, for the most part, you know, we have a, a great relationship with the TSA. So anytime we have a flight with an animal, um, I call my TSA contact and say, hey, you know, I've got a trainer coming through, you know, XYZ air- airport with a monkey. So as far as screening goes, it's a very smooth process. And then as far as airlines go, um, for the most part, the airlines still do recognize us and allow us to fly with our animals um, despite that ADA decision. The monkeys are not out of their carrier when they're on the airplane. They're in a carrier that, that sits underneath the seat in front of us, and they like to be nice and quiet and unnoticed when we're on an airplane. Yeah, yeah. I, I think we all have the stereotypical idea of the monkey and night at the museum. Um, yeah. The, yeah, that's the stereotypical thing that we think of. But that, as you said, that's not reality and it's not always the way that they want to be interacted with or or how they live, actually, because people have that misperception of dogs, you know, and they always think, from my experience anyway, they always think that they're like little robots. You know, that's the first thing they told me when I got my first service dog was, we're not giving you a robot. We're giving you a living, breathing animal that has wants, needs, and, you know, you're going to have to respond to that. Exactly. That's that's exactly what we tell our recipients. And we also tell them, you know, a lot about hierarchy. And you are not going to change the fact that this animal has a natural hierarchy and is going to be drawn to certain people and has certain rules about life. You need to change your behavior and understanding as a human being in order to live successfully with this animal. Yeah. And what do you think is helpful to recipients when they get their first monkey to really learn how to work with them? Really, you know, the people we're looking for are the people that are really patient and invested. You know, people think either like, you know, Night at the Museum, that this is going to be this monkey that's going to just like them immediately and is going to trust them immediately. What we try to make it really clear is it takes a good six months to a year to really fully bond with an animal. And, and the bond grows even more after that period. So it's somebody that's really going to understand and take that time and be patient and is going to enjoy the little steps that are going to happen throughout that first three to six months and really give that animal time to bond and understand and develop trust. Yeah, yeah, which, I mean, that's so important, that bond. And how do you, if if it's someone that's a quadriplegic that has a caregiver, how do you assist them in working with their monkey so that they bond more with the individual with the disability as opposed to the caregiver or the person without a disability? You know, it's certainly a delicate process, but we're always making sure the person that is living with a disability, you know, is the person that's giving the most praise and all the commands and all the treats so that that person is really um, (laughs) alpha. I mean, the weight of a monkey is hard. It's through their stomach. So, um, um, you know, it is a delicate process. And and our trainers are on, on the phone and email with recipients and their caregivers at least once or twice a day in the beginning. Um, And then it goes to weekly and a couple times a week. So, you know, it's a, it's a long process. We provide 24 hour 
phone support and, and months worth of really intensive support after we place the animal. Yeah. What kind of treats do you like to use with them? Monkeys really like peanut butter for training treats, but then they also enjoy things like walnuts, whole oats, oatmeal is very healthy for them. Mm. Um, you know, we try to keep it really, really healthy because monkeys can develop diabetes if they're given the wrong, the wrong foods. Yeah. Yeah. And I, how is it for people who are quadriplegic to give treats? How do they um, do that? We typically will, um, if somebody has a little bit of, you know, for example, some bicep control or something like that, we can design a treat reward dispenser that will hold peanut butter on their chair that they can dip a finger into and give a, a lick of peanut butter. Um, if, they don't have that, if they don't have that ability, we actually have a, a liquid reward dispenser as well, which is essentially built so that they can blow into a tube and give a small amount of a, a little bit of um, watered-down juice as a treat instead. Yeah. Well, I love that, how you're really, you've thought of some really creative ways so that the person with a disability can really interact and care for their monkey, which is just so awesome and so important, like we've said, with the bonding. Because I know for me with my service dog, I have to use my voice a lot because if I can't reach them to touch them if I'm laying down or have fallen or something like that, that I need them to be motivated by my voice instead of necessarily by that touch. Yeah, exactly. And that's and we, the same thing with monkeys. We train people how to use different tones in their voice so that, you know, they can, you know, express different feelings and the monkeys certainly react to that as well. Yeah. And so where do the monkeys stay during the day? Are they are they on any kind of leash? Are they free to, to move around or they have their crate? Um, it really depends on the home environment. Some monkeys are on a, on a long leash if it's a really open home environment that's not completely uh, monkey-proofed. Um, other monkeys are loose in a room, specifically a room that they spend the majority of their time in, and that's a little bit more monkey-proof. So it really depends. We, we make that decision on a home-by-home basis. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was just wondering about that, about, and when the person leaves the home, like to go to a doctor's appointment or something like that, do they crate the monkey then or? Yep, yep. They go back to their cage and their cage, as I said, is is very large and it's kind of like their bedroom within their home. So they have their blankets and their toys and their food and their water. It's really like their safe zone. So I tell people, you know, they're happy, you know, cuddled up in their blankets in their cage. You leave the TV on for them and and they're good to go (laughs) while you leave the house. Yep, yep. I whistle a doors his crate. I mean, that is definitely a happy place for him. So yeah, that's wonderful. And what kind of toys do they usually like to play with? You know, monkeys are are, are all different, but typically like, you know, toys with moving parts that make fun noises and, you know, that they can slide pieces back and forth and those types of things. But then, you know, other monkeys will make a toy just out of an empty Poland Springs bottle. So, you know, it, it, it all, it all depends on the animal. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's great. So again, for all budgets, you can find some kind of toy that will will interest them and make them happy. <laughs> exactly. And, and we set we set up all of our recipients, our new recipients, with we have brand new toys and new blankets and everything when we do that placement. So we pay for all that in the initial phase. Well, it is so impressive of what comprehensive services that Helping Hands provides. That's really extraordinary. Thank you. Thank you. It's something that we really believe in, and we've seen a lot of people's lives really changed for the better with these animals and as they develop bonds and you know they come back to us and they say I don't know how I lived you know yeah. the first 17 years of my injury without this animal I yeah. changed my life well I can certainly echo that because I thought I was pretty independent until I got my first service animal and it changed my life and I can only imagine what it can do for people who have limited mobility and who are remaining at home most of their time I can't imagine how that can change their life. That's awesome. Well, tell our listeners how they could help. So I know you have a wonderful website, but if they want to be a a volunteer, if they want to donate, what should they do, Megan? Yep, everything is on our website, and certainly our number for our Boston office is on our website. You can always give us a call at 617-787-4419 or visit www.monkeyhelpers.org. So if people are interested in volunteering or being a foster home or you know donating, every dollar, whether it's $5 or $500, is really going to make a huge difference in somebody's life. And as I said before, we're always looking for new applicants. We're always happy to answer questions and, and talk about the program and the process with people that think, you know, I'm not so sure about this, but maybe maybe this would be a good thing in my life. We're, we're more than happy to, to talk to anybody who, who is interested in, in applying. 
Well, that is so encouraging because we always hear that people, you know, are the agencies are so inundated with people wanting the animals and the lists are so long and it takes so long to get an animal. So that's so great that you guys encourage people to go ahead and apply and to see because with 180 monkeys in your program at, at one time, that's a great possibility that, that you might have a match for someone. Absolutely. We, we're going to have eight or ten monkeys ready to graduate this year. So there's somebody out there listening that might just be just the right match for one of those animals. Well, that is so exciting. And I can't thank you enough for coming on today and being with us and talking about Helping Hands and, and all the wonderful work that you're doing. It's really remarkable. So thank you so much, Megan. Thank you for having us. And we thank you, our listeners, for being with us today. And if you'd like more information about Helping Hands, as Megan said, their website is monkeyhelpers.org. And we will have that information posted on our website. So if you have any questions or would like any additional information, please get in touch with them. And thank you for being with us. And we loved your emails and your questions. So please keep those coming. Whistle and I appreciate getting those. And you can reach us at Marcy, M-A-R-C-I-E, at PetLifeRadio.com. So thanks so much for being with us, and we hope you'll come back really soon. Take good care. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.